Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Giacomo Delle Donne. I'm an assistant professor of constitutional law at uh, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa. I'm one of the editors of the STAS project and paper archive, uh, together with uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Giuseppe Martinico, and with uh, Filippo Fontanelli. The STAS project was launched by uh, the regretted Professor uh, uh, Paolo Carrozza, whom uh, some of uh, our Brazilian colleagues have uh, uh, met some time ago. Um, today, today's webinar is uh, focusing on a recent crisis. The idea of discussing uh, the crisis of constitutional democracy in Brazil uh, came to me after the attacks uh, to the uh, institutional buildings in Brasilia earlier this January. And uh, uh, to do so, we are very happy to host, uh, either in person or virtually, three distinguished colleagues uh, from three uh, academic institutions in Brazil, uh, three academic institutions that are also located in three different uh, regions of uh, this uh, in enormous country. So we have a colleague from uh, uh, Minas Gerais, Professor Emilio Peluso Nedermeyer, uh, Estefania Maria de Queiroz Barbosa from uh, the uh, Universidad Federal de Paraná in the south, uh, and uh, Marcelo Labanca Correa de Araujo from the Universidad Católica de Pernambuco in the northeast. They will approach this topic, uh, the crisis, uh, the contestation of uh, constitutional democracy from three different uh, viewpoints. Uh, uh, after their, interven their, their, their interventions, there will be some time for uh, discussion uh, with the audience, for questions and uh, comments. So thank you, thank you. It's a great pleasure to have uh, the three of you uh, here. We will follow the alphabetic order Portuguese uh, fashion. So uh, the first to take floor will be Emilio Peluso Nedermeyer, whom I uh, wholeheartedly thank for uh, having joined uh, this uh, WebEx uh, session. Please, uh, uh, Emilio. Right, so everyone, thank you very much for this invitation from Professor Giacomo Deledone uh, and from uh, Professor Marcel Labanca. It's also uh, a great pleasure to see some familiar names here today uh, at the University of uh, Santana. Uh, Nejin, for, for instance, is also here in this meeting. Uh, it's also good to be uh, again with uh, Stefania. We've been together in very different uh, situations during the, the past few years. Uh, and uh, what I hope to do is to try to show you some of the causes of the, the, this recent constitutional crisis and to differentiate uh, all the elements that are important to understand it. I will share my screen, just a second. And uh, you can all see. Uh, yes. Just check if this. Okay, so it's on full screen now. Uh, the title of my of my uh, presentation is from democratic erosion to rupture, controlling the Brazilian constitutional crisis. Uh, what I try to show and to to understand is that uh, we are uh, actually in a in a process that uh, is not uh, something that Brazil uh, is confronting or uh, facing alone. We have a look in a, in a, in a comparison, it's easy to see that there is a, uh, an authoritarian reflux throughout the world, uh, just to name a few uh, situations in which uh, we can make some comparisons. And I think that some of the leaders that have this authoritarian fashion, they also do this kind of thing. And this uh, is important for us to uh, even to try to make a comparison between what happened in Brazil in the 80th, 80th uh, January uh, of this year and what happened in uh, the US in 2021. So uh, if we have a look in what's going on uh, in US uh, or uh, 
in, in other countries in the world, we will see that uh, the quality of democracy was decreasing from, let's say, at least 2010, 2013. Uh, we can see it clear, clearly if we take a look on the, the indexes that are offered to us from the, the VDEM. So if you have a look at, on how uh, the egalitarian component or uh, the liberal democracy uh, element, uh, they are all in this line of, uh, of uh, uh, recession. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, this is also what, what is taking place in Europe especially in the case of Hungary, which now seems that uh, uh, are, is facing uh, some, some answers from the European Union. The same can be said uh, for India and other countries uh, throughout the world. But uh, what, what I try to, to uh, make uh, today is to show that we, are, we have some elements that differentiate the case of Brazil. So from 2014 on, we've been dealing with problems and some of these problems are connected with not just what happened recently with this uh, transition from Bolsonaro's government to Lula's government. We have a problem that uh, we have some problems in our constitutional organization that are linked to uh, the transition from uh, the dictatorship of 1964-1985 to uh, the democratic scenario from 1988 on. We can see, for instance, that uh, uh, not having take uh, or making effective criminal responsibility for crimes that took place during that military dictatorship made that the armed forces could have a very strong position in our system. So if the 1988 constitution indicates and textually uh, specifies that the armed forces are just a bureaucracy that should be uh, uh, on the executive branch and, uh, uh, and should follow orders by the executive branch. What we can see is that uh, recently they are gaining each time more uh, power and, uh, and we can, can call it, this is a this is as a process of militarization of politics and uh and some of this uh, uh movements are connected with this absence of accountability for what uh has been taking place in brazil uh i would say not only during the the, the last military dictatorship but throughout our constitutional history so we can see that we face problems from uh, what Rudy Taito calls uh, transitional constitutionalism. But this is not the only cause for uh, the process of uh, erosion of democracy that is taking place in Brazil. I think that the, another element that we should bear in mind is the fact that we have a very uh, unequal society. Uh, we have a, a, a problem that should be addressed by the 1988 constitution, but uh, from the different governments from 1988 on, uh, being them on the left or uh, on the right, this is not the problem that was uh, faced with uh, seriousness by uh, those governments, although the leftist ones tried to uh, address some of these, uh, uh, of these problems. Uh, but there is also a, a problem linked to uh, the influence of social media and how uh, social media was important to enhance uh, what we could describe as a kind of uh, authoritarian disposition that is still in place in Brazil. So if we think about a very different society in, in which inequality is not probably, uh, is not properly a problem, uh, or let's say it's not a problem that is faced ser uh, seriously by uh, different governments. And uh, we link it to the way by which authoritarianism is part of uh, civil society in Brazil. Uh, we can see that the, the recent political crisis and the economic crisis, they were important to enhance uh, in the, let's say, most authoritarian or conservative uh, factions of Brazilian society, the support support needed for uh, the election of uh, Jair uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, 
And then we can see that there is also uh, the way by which Kurtz uh, paved uh, the, 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 the way for the, uh, the, the, the strengthening of a, a movement that we could describe as Bolsonarism or all those supporters of Bolsonaro, which are radical, some of them, but uh, most of them actually are people that uh, has, have this authoritarian uh, prayer predisposition. Uh, we can see there a, a, a photograph from uh, former minister, minister of Justice during uh, Bolsonaro's government, now a senator, Sergio Moro, who was uh, one of the most important figures in the Operation Car Wash, which was uh, or which is actually now seen as not just something that should address the problem of corruption in Brazil, but uh, something that could allow for the politicization of justice in Brazil, uh, the way by which rule of law was uh, uh, flawed and then was, uh, ma was made flexible throughout the last uh, uh, seven or, or six years. So there is also this uh, important thing that we should bear in mind. Although Kurds today in Brazil, they uh, play an important role in trying to control what's going on in this whole process of erosion, they were also important to uh, strengthen uh, conservative uh, political positions in Brazil. Again, the, the role of the armed forces is uh, truly important in this process. So on one side, the, the, the judicialization uh, or or actually the politicization of justice, but also the uh, militarization uh, of politics. Then we can see very different uh, uh, official uh, uh, generals who took place during Bolsonaro's government and uh, uh, allowed for that the, the armed forces could uh, think that they have uh, what they describe as a kind of moderating power uh, to control politics in Brazil. Bolsonaro was important throughout his government also to strengthen uh, politics that has that have a, a very uh, uh, authoritarian uh, background. So uh, the way by which people could have access to guns, uh, the way by which the government bought votes uh, from congressmen. So there is also an element of corruption here. The way by which uh, environmental policies were uh, all affected by this uh, uh, authoritarian perception. So there are very different uh, politics that show that uh, the, the Bolsonarist way of uh, seeing the world was also uh, important to strengthen the way or transform institutions in Brazil in a very authoritarian fashion. Then we could, could also talk about, let's see, probably during our uh, uh, Q&A uh, uh, session, the way by which uh, this uh, institutional Bolsonarism was important to strengthen uh, illiberalism in Brazil. So uh, we have here different uh, 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 people that uh, would uh, be one of the main uh, uh, theoretical uh, backgrounds of uh, liberalism through throughout different countries in, in the world, and in Brazil we also have uh, had this uh, opportunity to create uh, a very strong support for Bolsonaro because of this part or portion of his civil society who believes that uh, uh, authoritarian politics they have the, their their opportunity they are important and they should be uh, strengthened as a political option. Uh, this is another. Uh, uh, feature of this movement of uh, Bolsonarism. Uh, it's not properly uh, a movement that has uh, homogeneity, it's uh, uh, an heterogeneous uh, movement that uh, congregates very different uh, people, but uh, which we can see that share at least this way of, uh, of thinking of politics in a illiberal fashion. Uh, with uh, a lot of opportunism in politics, uh, with a kind of uh, freedom of, uh, without responsibility, as our colleagues here in Brazil, uh, Thomas Bustamante and uh, Conrado Mendes, uh, described this, uh, this movement. The way by which they were important to uh, make institutional capture, so we didn't see throughout the government any good 
answers coming from our uh, general uh, prosecutor, uh, federal prosecutor here in Brazil, because this was a way by which Bolsonaro was able to capture an institution. And we can see that all uh, this movement uh, has a kind of uh, juridical uh, resentment in the sense that they see uh, juridical institutions as always an obstacle and always linked to uh, progressive ways of seeing politics. But the most important thing uh, throughout this, this movement was this change from a process of erosion to a process of rupture. So to uh, go on with a, an attempt of a, a collapse, a whole collapse of democracy. You can see here one of the pictures of the 8th uh, January 2023. And what we saw here in Brazil was clearly an attempt uh, of a coup d'etat. So by the occupation of the main buildings, as Giacomo described uh, at the start of this event, of the, of the main events that uh, were the buildings of the Federal Supreme Court, the National Congress, Congress and the presidency, we can see that the political violence is something really important for uh, this movement that we could describe as Bolsonarism. So we had some protests throughout the, the last months, right after the, the election of, uh, of Lula uh, for the presidency. We saw that uh, the armed forces, they protected and they allowed that in their uh, uh, facilities, these process, protests could take place. And even on the 8th of uh, January, we saw that uh, the armed forces, uh, by orders from uh, their most uh, superior uh, uh, generals or commanders, or even in the case, we are, we are still on, on an investigation uh, of that, but uh, it looks like, like the, the very uh, army commander uh, gave uh, an order for, the, the, for avoiding that people should be arrested in the, the armed forces, in the army's uh, facilities in that day. So uh, then we can see that uh, this is not properly the case, uh, the, the, the case here in Brazil is not actually just a case of democratic erosion, it's also a case that has an element of uh, uh, rupture or collapse. Uh, finally, just, uh, and just quickly, I think that my, my, my time is almost uh, uh, ending. Uh, what we saw was that uh, uh, maybe institutions uh, here in Brazil are stronger than we thought in the previous years. Uh, first of all, we saw that the federal Supreme Court really became an obstacle for very different uh, authoritarian goals, goals that Bolsonaro was displaying. Uh, the federal Supreme Court, although uh, its building was attacked and, and uh, destroyed, uh, stood uh, strong and uh, avoided that uh, uh, that we could have a violence that could escalate to uh, 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 really uh, an absence of authority here in Brazil and the, the, the something that could lead to, for instance, the intervention of the, the very armed forces uh, in politics. Uh, but we need we still need to respond strongly to the, to those uh, to those attacks. And what we we are seeing is that. Uh, in the federal Supreme Court, a previous investigation is leading to several uh, uh, prisons, and we need now to uh, go on with these uh, procedures that uh, are really taking place uh, to lead to criminal uh, legislation enforcement on the protection of the, the, the constitutional democratic state. Uh, there is a longer process that would involve, involve civilian education, but this is something that uh, probably we need to think uh, for the, 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 the next governments. And uh, we need also to consider that uh, the way by which uh, the executive branch in Brazil is organized through what we call the coalition presidentialism is also important to show that very different sources of power or forces uh, support the government and would avoid that uh, a military dictatorship could be reinstalled here in Brazil. Finally, and probably most uh, the most important element connected to the, the whole theme of this event, uh, we saw that the support of the 27 governors of uh, our uh, 
federation were truly was truly important to uh, show that uh, they would not back any kind of, uh, of military coup here in Brazil. Uh, I will stay uh, here. Uh, I think that uh, we can discuss a little bit more in our uh, Q&A. And uh, that's it, uh, Giacomo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emilio. Thanks indeed. It was a great introduction to the main uh, relevant issues uh, in this, the recent crisis and the January crisis and the uh, year-long uh, process of uh, erosion, decay, etc., and the likes of these uh, of uh, uh, constitutional democracy in uh, Brazil. Uh, now, we uh, are going to focus on two more specific dimensions in the, in the other interventions. Uh, Estefania uh, Maria de Queiroz Barbosa will speak about uh, uh, challenges to constitutional democracy and the uh, federal uh, Supreme Court. Now, I think uh, it's better if you check. Yeah. Please. Thank you. And the presentation is on uh, Hi everyone. First, I'd like to thank the invitation of Professor Giacomo Daledoni and also Professor Labanca. Uh, it's hard for me to speak in English after three months in Italy, trying to speak Italian. And the, the key to uh, another language goes to Italian. But um, I will try to talk so, something like that uh, about that. Um, uh, Professor Emilio is our expert in uh, uh, Brazilian democratic erosion. He wrote a book, uh, a very important book about that. And um, I will repeat some uh, issues that uh, he had uh, already spoke, but in other sense, uh, we work together also in an observatory about uh, Brazilian elections, and uh, we did two uh, complaints to uh, United Nations and the uh, International Court of Human Rights about the uh, situation of uh, Brazilian democracy, and we uh, we thought that uh, this could happen. But then, after um, Lula first uh, January, we thought, oh, it was just an alarm that we thought before. But um, so here it's the building of our Supreme Court in eight. Uh, January. Um, I was here in Italy coming from Syracuse to Palermo when I heard about uh, the, the invasion. Uh, how do I? Ah, okay, I, I found it. Um, as Professor uh, Emilio said, we are facing an, uh, a world autocratization. So it's not just only in Brazil. But uh, Viden says that 54% uh, of the world's population lives under authoritarian regime. So um, we, we have to think together. Brazil loses, uh, lost liberal democracy status before uh, the world. First, we were liberal democracy then. Uh, on 2020, we passed to electoral democracy by the, um, the Viden analyzed. Um, and 
You can see also uh, other appointments about free and fair elections, CSO repression, freedom of academic and cultural expression, uh, government censorship efforts, uh, government dissemination of domestic false information. Uh, that was uh, very important in Brazil and um, dangerous. Um, the false information, fake news, uh, produced by the government, by the president, even during the pandemic, uh, respect for counter arguments. So this is Viden uh, analysis. Um, we are uh, between the top 10 men autocratizing countries. Um, we are just um, after Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Brazil, it's the fourth in this um, analysis. Um, uh, uh, even IDEA, uh, international organization also for analyzing democracy. Uh, in the report of democracy in the Americas, uh, says that Brazil is the country facing the biggest democratic setback in the world during Bolsonaro's government with the greatest number of attributes that measure the level of its falling democracy. Um, we have uh, also in this report of uh, America, um, IDEA says that, or IDEA <laughs> says that um, the attacks to electoral bodies uh, had grown up in all a lot of countries in Latin America. It's not just a, a Brazilian problem. It's a practice that adopted by ultra-right populist leaders. Actually, in Brazil, we had uh, like a Capitolio at, at January 8th, but uh, it's like uh, we were uh, seeing in slow motion for a year after the capital of US, we knew that it could happen in Brazil because Bolsonaro was repeating the same thing about electoral fraud, um, even when uh, he was, uh, even before the, the elections. And we have a whole uh, um, kind of attacks on institutions and freedoms. It's like um, the constitutional um, patchwork or the constitutional democracy in Brazil. It's not just about uh, separate powers, legislative, uh, executive, and judiciary are not just uh, only about federalism, but also about uh, um, uh, a network with universities, journalists, um, uh, that um, like uh, research centers, everyone, uh, becomes part of this uh, control of the government and everyone was attacked. We had attacked on journalists, very hard, universities, teachers and academic freedom, political oppositors, uh, judicial power. We have uh, eight, uh, January 8th, but uh, we had every day an attack about uh, uh, about uh, Bolsonaro Ellis uh, to ministers and judges, electoral system and its judges because um, the elections in Brazil are organized by a tribunal uh, 
uh, elect a superior electoral tribunal uh, court, Tribunal Superior Eleitoral. We have uh, the problem of uh, neoconservatism that uh, comes together with authoritarianism, armored forces that Professor Emilio uh, talked about, and the cooptation of uh, government and public bodies. Um, the attacks on universities, teachers, uh, professors, and academic freedom, it's uh, with a budget, limited budget. Um, Bolsonaro uh, come to nominate uh, the dean, the director of the public universities. Also, we had a friend of our, us, Professor Conrado Bnev Mendes that suffered a criminal um, sue uh, because he criticized the um, general attorney of Brazil. So we had uh, a problem with the censorship of professor, uh, censorship to research bodies, Amazonas, um, and the census, censorship of knowledge bodies and statistics. In 2021, we didn't have our census. Government confirms that there will be no uh, EBG, EBGE census in 2021, that it's the most important uh, census and the statistics, the information in Brazil, we didn't have. Uh, it's very typical of an authoritarian government, so uh, we cannot know about uh, poverty, about deforestation, about uh, uh, anything. Uh, press censorship and attacks on journalists and also physical attacks to journalists. I don't know if you uh, have uh, written the notice uh, when Bolsonaro came to Rome uh, that their um, securities attacked uh, the journalists that uh, were there. So uh, Bolsonaro harasses journalists in Rome and security attacks reporters that uh, first it was like a hate speech, but then it was physical attack. Then attack on elections and electoral process. I go uh, faster. Um, the attack on the integrity of the electoral process. Brazil has uh, electronic systems of vote. So he wanted the stamped vote. Uh, but he tried to approve an amendment to change the system from electronic to common. Uh, Paper, paper uh, the vote on paper, uh, but the Congress didn't approve. But he didn't accept that. So uh, in the day after uh, he didn't uh, approve, he um, attacked the, the, the Supreme. Uh, he did a military parade uh, at the same day at Brasilia. Here we have uh, 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 an attempt to intimidate the legislative and judiciary branch. Uh, Bolsonaro posted on his social networks a video showing a military jeep passing in front of the Supreme Court, an image charged with symbolism in the current political contest in Brazil. Because these um, uh, menace of uh, military coup uh, was a, a base of um, 
how can I say, um, uh, sustainability <laughs> supporters of Bolsonaro. So he had to uh, talk about a possibility of military coup for his supporters. And uh, he tried to intimidate the other branches. Um, the attacks on the uh, Supreme Court and the Electoral Court and its ministers were every day at uh, WhatsApp, Twitter, and also uh, when uh, in his speeches, um, speeches, uh, discurso ameaçador uh, with the Republic Council. Uh, he uh, tried the judges as the enemies. Judicial authorities in Brazil, the Supreme Court and Superior Electoral Court in particular, faced an unprecedented campaign of distrust and public threats to judges who decide against the government's agenda. Um, the attacks on the judiciary in Brazil, you can see by uh, a video graphic, In the Independence Days, Day of 2021, he attacked a, a Supreme Federal Court and its justices. But he attacked saying that he will not obey a decision from the Supreme Court. And also he attacked the minister Alexandre de Moraes, that is the, the judge, judge, the principal judge of uh, um, the act is anti-democratic, the anti-democratic acts and fake news in Brazil. And also he was the president of electoral court during the election. So, he is a very important judge, uh, justice in Brazil. So he attacked him and uh, um, see, either this minister, Alexandre de Moraes, fits in or he asks to leave, to fire your inquiries. Get out, Alexandre de Moraes. Stop being a scoundrel. Stop oppressing the Brazilian people. Stop censoring uh, your people. More than that, we must, yes, because I speak on your behalf, determine that all political prisoners are released. Um, he uh, did a petition of um, impeachment of this justice. Bolsonaro signed a petition of uh, impeachment of Alexandre de Moraes. Also, we had uh, Professor Emilio already said about it, uh, and, uh, a delegitimization through mass disinformation. In Bolsonaro's, Bolsonarist groups, we have a uh, coordinated uh, mass disinformation against court and justice every day as enemy, as corrupt, as co-involved um, with uh, organized crime, uh, everything uh, uh, absurd. Uh, but uh, we have this false claims that Justice Roberto Barroso, that will be in Pisa next uh, week in the Alta Formazione, uh, defended pedophiles. Uh, and people uh, that live in this world of WhatsApp, they uh, believe in that. They want to believe because they hate every justice. And the Supreme Court 
also in the last years um, have a protagonism in Brazil because of the judicialization of politics. So uh, during the pandemic, also we have a lot of judicialization of politics and health uh, issues. Uh, and they are uh, every day in the press and the, everyone in Brazil knows uh, uh, the name of uh, uh, each justice. This is crazy because, uh, and we have a TV Justiça uh, um, where you can see every judgment, um, how can I say, ao vivo, uh, at the same time that it's occurring. Uh, live streaming. Live streaming. The TV Justice is live streaming. So we had this impeachment against Justice Alexandre de Moraes. We have also another project of constitutional amendment that did not pass to lower retirement ages uh, from 75 to 70 years. If it passed, Bolsonaro could have nominated uh, two more justices, but uh, it didn't pass. Uh, we had also another uh, attack from a deputy of uh, Bolsonaro's base, uh, a, a, a great ally to Bolsonaro, Daniel Silveira, that attacked the Supreme Court. Um, um, and he was judged and sentenced uh, for crimes involving threats and encouragement of physical violence against the judges and uh, the violent abolition of democracy. And the day after the sentence of the court, uh, Bolsonaro uh, pardoned him. Uh, like um, it's a, a direct attack to uh, to the court. So we have also the armed forces and the militarization of civilian bureaucracy. My time has gone, but uh, um, we had also the weapon. Uh, is guaranteed to preserve democracy no matter the means used. Uh, Bolsonaro did a political uh, promotion to uh, civilians' guns. Uh, so Brazil doubles the number of guns in civilian hands in just three years. Um, after more than 40 Bolsonaro decreased Brazilians by uh, 1,300 guns a day. Uh, some months, I, I think on September or August, I participated uh, with a group of journalists of ACANU, of Credenciated to ONU to the United Nations, and they asked me <laughs> if Bolsonaro will accept a possible defeat in the elections, or will he attempt a self-coup d'etat to keep power? Could a U.S. capital attack happen in, Bra in Brazil as well? And I said, yes. The most important political scientists in Brazil are learning about a capital attack in Brazil. We talked about that. Uh, I talked about that. Emilio Sergio Branches um, uh, talked about that. Uh, Justice Fakin talked about that. But uh, as we are waiting for the capital attack. Um, the problem of the, the Supreme Court in containment of this authoritarian advance. The problem, I think, it's the role of courts in times of democratic normality that we think about uh, 
activism or self-restraint, but now uh, it's like they are in the political space, but they don't have uh, um, the people legitimization. They, they are not legitimized by the people. They are nominated. So it's difficult for them uh, to have this support of the people in Brazil, even if Lula's supporters are with the Kurt, but the Bolsonarist supporters are against the Kurt. And um, uh, Kinlane Chapelle, when she talked about uh, Hungary and the European Court of Human Rights, she said, okay, the European Court of Human Rights added the National Court of Hungary to uh, stay uh, a little more uh, against a, 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 an authoritarian regime. But uh, the Court cannot do the work together to save the democracy. So, um, the transfer of the Kurds to the political arena puts them in a fragile situation since their legitimation starts to depend on popular approval in a path of no return, giving space to authoritarian practice for their weakening. The challenges, uh, it's, uh, I think, fake uh, because we don't, uh, it's very difficult. The platforms doesn't have a responsibility about uh, uh, fake news, the, co the content of uh, information. Uh, they are attacked on their reputation and credibility. Uh, also, this popular scrutiny, it's very hard in Brazil. Um, it would be a challenge to judge crimes against democracies, democracy observing the rule of law. This, uh, Emilio can talk further on the key and uh, a, a time um, about uh, judge crimes uh, committed by military in the tentative of coup d'etat. Uh, and how to judge Bolsonaro for his crime. It's very hard. Uh, his sons and his allies, but uh, judge Bolsonaro for his crime, uh, it should be a challenge for the Supreme Court. But uh, we have to face it because um, we feel uh, if we don't... Um, Judge militaries and uh, Bolsonaro, we are not uh, changing to a really democratic uh, country. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry for my English, it's very hard in these days. <laughs> thank you. I don't know how to, I almost closed the, the section. <laughs> thank you, Stefani. <laughs> Okay. Thanks indeed, uh, Estefania. Great presentation, which has uh, raised uh, a number of points uh, on uh, also the relation, which is uh, always a very complicated one between, I would say, the legal and the political dimension of constitutional democracy, the risk uh, of uh, uh, an overexposition of judicial actors. This was quite of an issue during the uh, 20 year, 20 year long transition uh, of Hungary to constitutional democracy. So the strong role of the Hungarian constitutional court in uh, building up uh, a, a constitutional democracy uh, there. Now, it's uh, the turn of uh, uh, Marcelo Labanca. Marcelo Labanca is uh, an old acquaintance. Uh, he has uh, already visited uh, Pisa on a number of occasions. And uh, um, 
and uh, uh, we have developed a number of uh, projects uh, uh, together. Now, uh, the idea of organizing a webinar on uh, The idea of organizing a webinar on the crisis uh, in Brazil first came to me uh, because of the interplay of federal and uh, state officials during uh, and after the attacks uh, on the buildings and the institutional buildings in Brazilia. We heard of uh, uh, tense uh, dialogues of uh, conflicts, uh, perhaps also uh, implicit, unspoken and explicit conflicts between the federal government and the government of uh, the federal district, the possible involvement of uh, the state government of the federal district of Brazil in not hindering or possibly also fostering those attacks, the uh, prominent role in the state government of the federal district uh, of uh, a former minister of uh, the Bolsonaro administration and the subsequent removal of uh, this official from his post. So the idea was uh, let's have a talk about authoritarianism and uh, federalism in Brazil and that's why I uh, I got in touch uh, with uh, uh, Professor Marcelo Labanca, who has uh, uh, made uh, lots of research about uh, uh, federalism, also in uh, a uh, comparative uh, fashion. And also in no, no. no. Okay. In a while, we will be launching. Otherwise, I'm going to be also in the. Yeah, that's uh, easier. It is taking a while for those who are attending online. Okay. We're almost there. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, Marcelo, thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you. Now, well, so I can speak. Uh, I think it's uh, it's better. In your seat because I don't know if the microphone. Uh, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, as a, as a professor, uh, technology makes no that problem. No problem. Easier, but it makes some other things more difficult. Because I, I have, I don't know if in English, <laughs> how you call it, I have TDAH. So I, I like to give, give my classes like uh, walking and well. So. Let's go ahead. Thank you very much, Giacomo, to of uh, to be here with with you all and this uh, Santon University. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, forgive my mistakes in, in the in the English. My mind is very rusty. But uh, first of all, I like to to say a few words in uh, for my friend uh, Paulo Carrozza. 
he was professor here at Central University, and he was all, not only a professor, but a great, uh, great, great person, great uh, human being. And he, uh, I miss him. And um, I think some months uh, uh, when F some months, no, some years ago, um, he, when we spoke, sorry, I, I, I'm a little bit, <laughs> he, he told me, he asked me for some, some uh, researches together here in Santana University and for me to give a, a course here. And he invited me, but he didn't make it. Uh, he didn't make it because he uh, unfortunately is not with us. Well, and here's my, 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 uh, I don't know how, how to say it in English, but my pensiero. My thoughts. My thoughts, yeah. To this great professor, that it's Paolo Garrozza. Well, uh, let's go ahead and talk about federalism and the authoritarianism with, uh, in Brazil fighting, fighting. I would say fighting Bolsonaro, but uh, maybe fighting authorities, it's, it's better. But I don't know if they are the same. And uh, let's start. Let's start here. Well, can I move on my, my screen here? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't go. Or Okay, 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 here. Okay, thank you. And here, a uh, preliminary clarification about uh, Brazilian federalism. I'm going to be uh, it's a very short uh, explanation. Here we have three flags. Brazil is a federation, is a federal state since uh, 1889. Uh, it was a, a Brazilian, Brazil was, it was a, an empire and uh, from Portugal. And this is the flag of Brazilian empire, this here. I think you can see there. And uh, after, after the empire, we had the Republic in 1989. And this was the first flag of our Republic. It's almost the, the same of United States flag. We have this flag here for uh, only four days and then this other one that it's our flag uh, since then. We have 26 states and one federal district that has autonomy uh, as a state. I'm going to, 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 I'm going to give a, a specific explanation about the federal district in a few minutes. And well, we have uh, a, a system of division of competencies, the private and shared competencies, like in almost all uh, federal states, uh, our private competencies, uh, they are uh, the, 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 it, the, the federal constitution uses the model of the dual federalism and also the model of cooperative federalism. But what I want to say here is that the Federal Supreme Court, Brazilian Federal Supreme Court, plays a imp very important, very important role about these competencies. Very important role. Uh, and if you if you see uh, the history of the Supreme Court, American Supreme Court, is almost the same because. In federal, in, in dual federalism in the United States, you have there, you had there uh, a very important, also a very important uh, role being uh, being played by the the U.S. Supreme Court to say who uh, is the competent, or who has, who 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 is in charge in in which matter. We have uh, some discussions about this in how the Supreme, the Federal Supreme Court, uh, central, uh, decentralization was in, in, 
in the way to give more power to states, but not, not more power to states, this is important to say, was to, to not to give powers to the federal government so he, the federal government could not, uh, uh, could not protect rights. Can I give an example? An example about this, it was the law, a law made by the, the federal government that uh, a prohibition to, for, for the, to the interstate commercial clause to uh, uh, toys or, or anything that was, not, not toys, sorry, anything that was, was built or made by children. The, the labor, like a, 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 a prohibition to children to to uh, be in, in to, to labor, to uh, like a labor law, but it was a prohibition to uh, the interstate commercial products made by children. And the Supreme Court said, well, <laughs> you can't, you, you federal government can't do this law, can, can't make this law because this law is uh, you, you don't you don't have this competence this competence because you are you are you want to rule about labor law not about interstate commercial clause but what really in fact wanted at the, the, the u.s supreme court to have a, a liberal system, economic liberal system, so not to uh, uh, interfere in the in the economy, because the states didn't made no prohibition about this, and the children was there working. That's the point. So the U.S. Supreme Court played this 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 role about competences, but was not uh, something about. Who has the competencies? Is level state, uh, state level, or uh, uh, federal level? It was about uh, more economic liberty to to uh, make uh, unprotection rights, like something like this. And well, and what about Brazil? What about Brazil? Brazil also have a Supreme Court. And also had a very, very centralized point of view about federalism. So the Brazilian Supreme Court made a, a, a jurisprudence very centralized about federalism. In, in, in the subject of uh, division of competences, conflict of competences, ruling not in favor of states like the US, but ruling uh, in favor of the federal government. This is important to say now because this changed with the, the Bolsonaro government, with the authoritarianism. It's changed. But I have to say this because uh, everybody says, well, Brazil is a very, it's a, a mononational federation, it's a very centralized. Uh, but, well, it's not centralized because of our constitution. It's centralized because of the Supreme Court. It always have, ha, has been like this. In all, all of those conflict of competencies that you have some doubts, well, this is like a, in which subject it, 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 it uh, match. It, this is a, a private competences or it's a concurrent competences. Well, always the court push it, the point to the federal government. So, this is the fact, but, but we have a new year, a, a new era. So see the competences in, in health matter. If in the past you have there, uh, like, a, a clearly divided, uh, functions in our days, in our days, you have like, a. uh, Mesclid competences about federal government and state government. And the health is a matter of shared competences in our constitution. So if you if you have some 
curiosity, you can go to our contribution, Article 24, and you see which are the subjects that they are shared competencies from federal and state governments. And the health is one of those. And why I'm saying health? Because this is the main point about fighting Bolsonaro with federalism. And I'm going to say in the next slide. Bolsonaro, <laughs> Bolsonaro made his government against rights, against rights, but against indigenous rights, against uh, uh, students' rights, against uh, minority, minority rights, racial uh, minorities, against women's, and also against health with the pandemic. So he, for example, he could, he could buy the vaccines like four, five months earlier, but he didn't because he is a negationist. He's a negationist, so he don't believe in science. And when we put a president, negationist, that don't believe in science, what you expect about this? So all of his government in, in, in several branches was a government against rights. So you had a, a federal, so ju just, <laughs> just uh, keep on mind that we had a Supreme Court with a uh, centralized point of view about division of competences, about conflicts of competences, always ruling in favor of the federal government. But now we have a federal government against rights. What are we going to do about this now? What the court is going to do about this? And more than this, the reaction of the member states. The reaction of the member states against Bolsonaro, against the public policy, with the er er erosion of democracy. So we, uh, there, there, there were, for example, uh, several states that they, they weren't like a political opposite of the federal government. They were uh, friends, but because of this politic, this Bolsonaro politic against rights, they become enemy. Let me, let me show here. This guy is uh, the, 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 Governor of state of Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo, it's the biggest state in in population in Brazil, Sao Paulo, and he was a friend of Bolsonaro. He he has been elected with Bolsonaro, and after this negationist uh, sh shape, I can say this in the federal government. He become enemy of Bolsonaro because the this guy Doria he was in favor of the vaccines and he started to do the vaccine in São Paulo with the São Paulo scientists and we have there old friends and now new enemies. And we have a tension, we have a, a, like a, a, this, this, this relation between member states and governors and uh, federal government changing. Changing why? To protect rights. So what I want to say here is that federalism in Brazil has a lot to do with right protection. 
it's not only a system of division of competencies, you know, of allocating competencies in, in a lower level, on the central level. It's not about it. It's about who can protect fundamental rights better. So we have in Brazil a progressive federalism because we have the state rights against Bolsonaro. And we use it, all those member states like Maranhão, Pernambuco, my state, São Paulo, that they, they were like a clearly opposite of the federal government. And they didn't cooperate. They didn't cooperate with, uh, with the federal government. So we have, but just, just, just pay, pay attention. This is not, uh, I think this is not the, the, the main point. The main point is that we had the Supreme Court also changing her mind or this, this turning key of the Supreme Court, because now the jurisprudence of the Supreme, of our Supreme Court couldn't, uh, couldn't be any more uh, centralized jurisprudence in favor of the federal government. Because we had there in Brazil like a, an uncooperative federalism. Almost like we saw in the United States with Trump, with some states being considered like sanctuary states or sanctuary cities in some matters of public policy, like the immigrant ones the illegal immigrants that uh, went to other states that were like states with more protection of their rights. So sanctuary states. But this is with the, I can say, this is where, uh, is with, 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 the, with the support of our Supreme Court. So our Supreme Court was like a, a principal, I think, actor to support a new or a rising of a new Brazilian federalism because the, the, the Brazilian federalism were, was uh, almost a centralized federalism in matter of division of, the division of competencies. And after Bolsonaro, we saw another federalism with the state actors acting protecting rights and all those conflicts of competencies were now analyzed by the perspective of progressive federalism. What's about now, in our days, now, the federal district and the coup? or the, 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 the Brazilian capital. What we can say about this, because, because you know, here in this, we are, we are in Bolsonaro government, but with Lula, because now we don't have Bolsonaro anymore. What's coming in the Brazilian federalism about authoritarianism? So we had uh, the, in 1st of January, January 1st, we had Lula president. But, you know, in Brazil, we have the federal district and the federal district has autonomy. It's like a, a state. It has a legislative power a judicial power, an executive power, the governor is being elected autonomy to choose their own uh, representative uh, deputies. It's 
almost like an estate, a state, a member state. It's curious. It's like different. You, you don't see that in, for example, in, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> but in Brazil, it's like a state with all autonomy that a state has, including the autonomy and the competence to uh, take care of the security, the police, for example, the military police, that is not uh, under the Ministry of Defense. It's a military police of the of the state of the federal district that we have also in Rio de Janeiro. Military police of Rio de Janeiro. And this autonomy, we have there a Secretary of Public Security that he was in charge from first of January, and. But in December, who was this guy? He was the Minister of Justice of Bolsonaro. So the Minister of Justice of Bolsonaro went to take care of the security system of the federal district because the governor, the governor the, of the, the federal district, it's a, like a friend of Bolsonaro. And what he did about the all, the all all that mess that happened in the 8th of January or the Brazilian capital, nothing. He went to Florida to see Mickey Mouse. And he did nothing. He didn't prepare like a, a security plan. And he was, and this omission, it cost his liberty because he now, now he is in jail because of the Brazilian capital. It was an attempt of a coup and because of the Brazilian capital, Lula made a decree of federal intervention. So we had in Brazil a federal intervention in a member, in a, in a, I, I can say, in a component unit of the federal system. All federal systems, or maybe most of them, has this provision uh, of uh, a possibility of federal intervention. It happened in Brazil five years ago with Rio de Janeiro, with the President Temer. He made a federal decree of intervention in Rio de Janeiro, but, but only in the public, in, in, in the security system. Because it wasn't working because of the, the uh, so many militias. How can I say in, uh, in, in English, militia? Paramilitary. paramilitary. Yeah, some para, because of the paramilitary in favelas in Rio de Janeiro. It was a, a, a great problem there, a big problem. And he made a, 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 a federal decree of intervention, but a sectorized intervention to take off the autonomy of Rio de Janeiro only in the security system. And Lula made the same now in the federal district. So now, in this day, what, which day is today? Today is 24, 25, 25, 25, January 10, 25. Today, the federal decision has no more autonomy to take care about, about security policy, uh, the, 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 the military police in the, in the federal district because of this federal intervention. And Lula named a guy of his, no? Uh, confiança. Some, sometimes I uh, trust, sorry. A guy of, of his trust to be in charge there in the federal district. And, well, 
in finishing. And what's next? Well, here's a photo with Lula and some of the judge of the Supreme Court. This is the Chief Justice, Rosa Weber, and the governors, state governors. Because after 8th of January, there was like a, a great, uh, a great meeting with all the 20, 26, 27 governors, 26 states, but I forget, I forget to, to say that the governor of the federal district was taken off by Alexander de Moraes. He's not there anymore. This is another question. <laughs> and there you have all of those state members going to, to Brasilia to uh, give Lula this support. And also the so many judges of the federal Supreme Court, unless two of them that was named by Bolsonaro the Supreme Court. And what I have to say, oh, what I want to say here is that in this period, this four years, states have like realized the power they have. For example, we have a, like a, a movement about occupation spaces from state or subnational legislatures in federal councils. And we have also uh, open dialogue between central power and state powers because of Lula. And what's going to happen? I think that the Bolsonarist states, because we have some of them, like, uh, I don't know if you, you, uh, you, uh, Floriano, or no, Santa Catarina. It's a state, like, it's a, I can say it, a Bolsonarist state. Not all of, all of the people of Santa Catarina is Bolsonarists, but the gov the government, the governors are, and also, the majority, the uh, majority population of Santa Catarina is supporter of Bolsonaro. Yeah, so we gotta we gotta see now this changing of this tension between member states and federal states. That's it. This is the the situation about Brazil and how federalism was. In an important issue to play this role to protection of to rights protection. Thank you very much indeed.